trying to get back to the basics of great products. Power comes from sharing information. I try to convince people to slow down. Free. Yeah. Open. This is the Soak by Smart Podcast. Hello everyone, welcome back to the Soaked by Slush podcast. My name is William von der Palen and in Copenhagen we have Isak Rauti. What's up, Isak? I'm good. How, how are you doing, Vili? I'm great, thanks. Happy to be back in the studio. Uh, since you, you practice pronouncing our guest's name, I'm going to let you do the honors and introduce him this time. Yes, let's do it. Okay, so in this episode of the Soaked by Slush podcast, our guest is Martin Mignot. Was that good? Well done. I'm very impressed. Thank you so much, I, I, Martin. I won't, I won't try to do your name. <laughs> no, you don't have to. But I won't stop saying your name, I think, at the end of the episode. I'm so satisfied with that. Thank you. Hey, thanks for coming to the episode of this uh, podcast. It's a pleasure to have you. Thanks having me. I'm super, I'm super pumped. Hey, uh, do you want to start off? This is kind of our lazy way to start every podcast, but uh, it's also a fun way to hear uh, how our guests uh, introduce themselves. So, you know, just the, the quick run around of, of who you are. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so I'm um, Martin Mignot, as Isaac said uh, really well. Uh, I'm one of the partners at Index Ventures, which is uh, one of the largest and most active early stage venture funds in Europe and in the US. We've been around for about 25 years uh, in investing in hundreds of, of companies. And at the moment, half of the team is in Europe, half is in San Francisco, but we work as one team, invest across Europe and the US uh, in equivalent amounts. We're investing uh, the latest funds that we raised uh, last year, which are about $2 billion, where we can be the first check and the last check pre-IPO. And, and we invest in enterprise software, SaaS, fintech, marketplaces, and consumer at large. And myself, I've been uh, with Index for 11 years. I'm one of the partners there. And I've invested all across Europe into uh, both the marketplace and SaaS uh, companies working with the likes of Deliveroo and Revolut and Trainline and Pazonio, Cree in Sweden and many others. Yeah, very well known uh, companies to, to most our listeners, I guess. Uh, what, what did you do before joining Index? What's kind of your background? Yeah, I was so, um, I come from an entrepreneurial family. So my dad was an entrepreneur. Uh, and so I always knew I wanted to do something in, in the space. And then I had a finance uh, background. I did a couple of years of investment banking, um, then helped my uh, now wife uh, launch a company, and, and then I joined, I joined Index. So that's, that's most of my career has been really at, at Index, to be honest. That's and awesome. Yeah, go ahead, Vili. Yeah, not a pla- not a bad place to be. And we agreed beforehand that we we would kind of talk about, uh, start off by talking about the, the European tech landscape, and especially from yes. funding. Uh, front funding point of view. So we, we we took some numbers with ESAC and looked at what's happening and it seems that there was uh, twice as much capital invested in European tech in Q1 of 2021 than basically any quarter before that. So do you have any any thoughts on, on why that is? Yeah, I have many thoughts, and it's true that you know since the day I joined 11 years ago uh, to today, it's it's uh, things have changed quite quite a bit. It's been a, a bit of a, a wild run, and uh, and things have accelerated. And I think that that's what happened with with you know with these businesses where they themselves have accelerated and have gotten a lot larger. You know, you have companies like uh, you know like Adyen, like Spotify, which are worth you know, 50 billion dollar plus, which was you know, would never have thought of, of anything of that magnitude, um, you know, a decade ago. Um, so so you, you've had companies growing very fast, especially in, in recent years, um, to larger scale, a lot faster. You have entrepreneurs and early team members who are starting company, who are investing in early stage companies. So you have that flywheel that's now, that's now pumping. And also just to some extent, I think there is there is just a catching up, you know, I mean, Europe always had fantastic talent, always have, you know, great infrastructure, you know, very fast, fast broadband. Um, and, 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 you know, the only thing that was somewhat lacking originally was the capital, but that's, that's, you know, that's what's happening now. There's a catching up and, and I think that piece has been solved as well. Um, now, the only thing that's left to do is really around around talent and around regulation, you know, make it easier for European company to scale quickly across Europe, to hire easily across Europe. That's the last missing piece that we've been fighting for, for, for a couple of years now with Index. 
So it sounds like it's a long uh, process that is now coming to some sort of culmination point. It's mm -hmm. easy to look at if we say Q1 of 2021, it's easy to make a connection with the pandemic and see how that has affected uh, this whole situation. Do you see that as sort of a, uh, it sounds like it's not a cause of this, and it's, but how do you see the role of the pandemic in this, in this culmination of Q1? Yeah, it's been it's been definitely a catalyst, um, and for I'd say two main reasons. One is the impact on the businesses themselves, um, which you know a lot of them have have benefited from from the fact that people were just stuck at home and had to had to use the internet for pretty much everything, from ordering food to to entertaining themselves. Um, so th th there has been, you know, obviously, you know, a lot of that, um, especially on the consumer front. You know, we've done a lot of consumer investments over the past the past twelve months um, because it was, there's really been an acceleration, and we believe that it's, you know, it's, for a lot of these businesses, it's it's given them a lot of new customers for a very low amount, but these customers are going to stick around. So it just made them better businesses, more profitable businesses, and growing fast from a bigger base of customers. So it's really, you know, gave them a big, a big, a big bump. Um, and obviously, the, the, the second aspect is also related to the, the VC business itself, you know, is that we used to have a very structured process where we had to meet in person for the due diligence, for the partner presentation. Folks had to fly to London to meet in person on Monday afternoon. You know, it was a very, very kind of limited window and very kind of strict and structured process. And all of that has just been thrown out. You know, now you can do due diligence. You know, any time of the any time of the week, um, you, you know, you spend half half a day and you meet. You know, 50, you know, 10, 10 people from the team and uh, the whole senior team. Um, so you can do you know much better due diligence. You get a lot more data because everything is now kind of being recorded and and, and monitored and everything is online. And then you can you know you can have partner presentation any time of the week. Why should it be on a on a Monday afternoon? It can be on a Thursday evening. It can be on a Friday morning. And, and especially you know, for us with the US team, it's made it a lot, you know, it's opened up a lot more, a lot more windows because again, you know, we work as, as one team together. So it's a bit more of a tactical thing, but I think that actually has had you know, a, a big impact on just the number of companies that you could meet. And also for entrepreneurs, especially in Europe, where if you were not based in London, you had to travel there, you could only meet the firms that were in London. Suddenly, you know, you can meet with anyone anywhere in Europe, but also, you know, in the US and, and the rest of the world. So it's made access to capital, access to people. It's really kind of turbocharged it. Yeah, it's kind of confusing from a founder's perspective, actually, because there's a lot of mixed signals, uh, at least. Uh, I've had a lot of discussions also about the, the EU you know, not being able to produce big companies, losing out on platform economies, over-regulating everything. Bullshit, bullshit. <laughs> don't, don't, don't believe that. <laughs> nice, so, okay. so as a founder... I uh, want to hear this debate. Yeah, no, it's not a debate from my side, but there's a lot of this discussion actually going on that, you know, Europe lost the platform economy, at least on the consumer side, and, and there's no big, big companies coming out. At, at, at least if you, you know, if you compare to companies like Google, Amazon, Facebook, they're really the giant tech companies. Um, so do you think Europe is still a good place to be as a founder? Absolutely. I mean, it's, you know, it's a, it's a great place to live. It's a great place to hire mm -hmm. talent. It's a great place to, um, to raise capital. I mean, what, I mean, you know, the, 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 the rule of law is, is, is fantastic. Um, I mean, I think it's, I think it's a fantastic place to live and, you know, you, you can attract talent and you, and the beauty is today, you don't even have to attract talent anymore. Uh, you can, you know, you, you can hire people from you know, wherever they are. So um, absolutely, you know, we've been bullish. I mean, that, that's, 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 you know, really why Index got set up 25 years ago. That was that we believe that there was, you know, you looked at, at, at the facts and, you know, the number of um, computer science graduates, there are more of them than in the U.S., um, you know, you've got great universities, you've got fantastic talent, you've got capital. Why? I mean, there's no reason why that wouldn't be the case. The only disadvantage that, that European companies have is the fragmentation of each individual European markets for certain types of industries. You know, obviously, if you do, you know, a lot of these businesses are going after global opportunities. You know, if you go for, you know, music or gaming, you know, there are, you know cons many consumer categories enterprise software. I mean, you see, you have very large markets that are global from day one, and you have had fantastic successes from European companies or European entrepreneurs who have moved to the US. So, um, you know, I, 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 there's no reason why that is. And I would even challenge the fact that it is true. You know, clearly, we don't have yet companies of the scale of, you know, of Google and Amazon. 
But if you look at the next generation of businesses, you know, Spotify is a platform business for, you know, for, for music. At the end, to a large extent, is a key infrastructure piece for, for the internet, for the e-commerce. Companies like Deliveroo, Delivery Hero, Just Eat, they are you know, new types of platforms for uh, hyper-local delivery. And you look at what's happening in the hyper-local delivery world, there are many more companies coming from Europe than from the US. Uh, and, and I would argue much more interesting companies because European seas are, are very dense. And so these businesses are very well suited to Europe. So I think we shouldn't, we shouldn't uh, listen to the, the defeatists and, and, uh, and the cynics uh, and just look at, at the facts. And if you just fast forward what's been happening in the past 10 years for the next 10 years, for sure, we're going to have some, some you know, giga platform scale businesses out of Europe. A lot of this sounds like music to my ears, Martin, but what do you think, if I'd rephrase William's question, because there's still something in it, how, why would you say that this hasn't happened already? It takes time. You know, I mean, I, I'm sorry, you know, it's a bit of an easy answer, but those, you know, when we talk about flywheel, that, that, that you know, you need to get started and then you need to leave it the time for the wheel to turn. You know, that's, right. and, and those cycles that, they, you know, from starting a company to going public, it will take you, at, you know, if you're really fast, it will take you seven years. You know, that delivery started in 2013 going, going public today. And that was a really, really fast growing business. Mm. Um, and if you are a bit less fast, it will take you, you know, most likely 10, 12, 15 years. You know, you were talking about TransferWise, you know, UiPath, Fantastic IPO. How long has it been around? Whatever, 15 years. So, you know, that so and until that's been happening, until these businesses are public, which means that the founders have made, you know, have become wealthy, the early team and the employees, and that's something we've been obviously pushing for with index for as many it's for every employee to have options and as many options as possible to really, you know, see that next generation. So you need these people to have some wealth, have experience seeing that scale and going through that scale but you know you need we just didn't have these companies and you know adyen spotify uipath deliveroo they, they've all you know come public fairly recently and only now you are seeing the next generation with even bigger ambitions more capital more experience but again you know, it's going to take them they started over the past five years so it's going to take them another five years you won't really see them at that scale in, for another five years yeah, I think that's a fair point. When you think about businesses like Google or Amazon, they obviously feel quite new, but people forget that they are already, you know, quite old. Microsoft and Apple are are like really old companies in in a sense. So it's not maybe it's not a fair comparison. I, I agree with and that. And they themselves, they themselves got built on the shoulders of giants, you know, and they got, uh, you know, Jeff Bezos True. invested in Google, and you know, so yeah. it, it it was already that that you know that flywheel was already there. They already had these these successful people around. Exactly. Um, and then which, which, you know, Europe is just getting to now. Yeah, while well, running the numbers also, we we, uh, we saw that running the numbers is sounds very fancy, but we, we came across the fact that also, you know, free seed and uh, seed rounds, both in amounts of capital and also amounts of rounds, uh, have been declining or not maybe declining, but staying quite stagnant uh, in uh, in Europe for the past five years. Is that something you're worried about? Because that's obviously maybe a bit part of the flywheel effect and, and also ensuring the future of, of big companies uh, being founded in Europe. We, you know, we, I, I, we haven't thought about that to a, to a massive extent, to be honest. You know, we are super bullish about seed. We, in fact, just launched a, a, a new seed fund called Index Origin, you know, $200 million. Uh, half of that is going to go, at least is going to go to, to European companies. So we have been doing, you know, a lot of seed, seed since the inception of index. We will, you know, double down, triple down on, on that. Um, I, I, don't, I don't see that, uh, you know, we, the, the, our pipeline has never been fuller. So I don't really recognize, I don't, I don't dispute the numbers. You know, I trust you guys, uh, you know, the, the quality of your, of your research and analysis, of course. But uh, I, you know, it's definitely not what, what we've seen. We've seen, we've seen tons of activity. And yeah, I think it's just maybe there is probably at any moment of time, there's probably a finite number of great opportunities because an opportunity, you know, if you think, if you take a step back, an opportunity is, is the meeting between a, a change in, in customer needs, whether the customer is a, you know, an individual or a company and a, 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 a technology enabling 
a new solution for that need. You know, and, and you need the two to be in to happen together. And at any moment of time, you, you only got so much technology and so much needs and so many entrepreneurs to go after that, you know, that opportunity sets. Um, and I think it's, it, you know, it, 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 they may have, it's clear there is a phenomenon where you have um, on these new, on these new opportunities, you have you know, a certain number of companies at the beginning, you know, running for it. And then very quickly, you know, when you see what's happening, you know, with the, with the 10 minute kind of grocery delivery is a good example where the winner gets, you know, the few winners get selected probably faster than they would have in the past, because it's just this, this, you know, this wall of capital that comes in very quickly, as soon as there's clear product market fit and you're on the large, and you're on the large market, then you have a wall of, of capital that focuses on a few opportunities that can then really get turbocharged and make it very big very quickly, um, which probably is you know m- maybe a, a, a new feature of this market. I'd like to speak more on uh, the Index Origins uh, project. Uh, why? Uh, what's the thesis behind that? The the thing is that um, we've we've always done you know we've always done a lot of seed. Uh, this is really part of the of the index DNA. You know, we we love to be the first check in a company, um, be there since the very early days, and and we also felt like we just wanted to help the ecosystem. You know, the spirit of this fund is not to be to build big ownership, to you know sharp elbowed other funds out of out of these rounds at all. It's the exact opposite. You know, we. We see it as a vehicle to actually work with the ecosystem, work with the early stage funds, with the angels. And whenever we invest, we try to bring in funds with us. We try to bring in angels, even if you know, in a way, it's you know, it, it, it's a pri- you know, to some extent, proprietary deal. The, the, you know, we very much you know want to use that to work and collaborate with more with more people and just help the ecosystem. Um, but for us, it's really a way to build relationships very early, see the stories from, from you know, the, the early day and, and, and help out on, you know, we've got some dedicated resources to help with the first hires, with the first customers. And that's just contributing to that, to that effort. Yeah, there's a lot of, uh, or there's other big VCs firm, VC firms doing the same, like Clyde and Perkins and Sequoia. Do you think they come from the same place? Is it, you know, about identifying and, and trying to get to the best founders as early as, as possible? I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to, to comment on, on their strategy. Uh, you know, I would, I would let them, I would let them do that. You know, I think the, 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 the thing that we're trying to do again, a little bit differently is that we are not proprietary, you know. I think that's 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 the thing that we really want. I want to emphasize here is that you know this is actually an opportunity for us to work with more 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 folks and not not the opposite. Um, and and I'm not sure that's the case for everyone. Right. There's also a uh, switching gears a little bit. Talk about companies going public, which is happening in massive numbers these days. Why do you think that is? Is this something temporary, or is this the the new status quo? Yeah, there there is a you know there's clearly a, a window that is open in the market. I think people are 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 keen on on getting exposure to to you know these fast growth opportunities you know in a world where there is low you know low low yield you know you need right. you know if you're managing you know large amount of money you need to find ways to generate growth and today it's more on the capital growth side of things that is generated by these companies um, I think that there's just the fact that that people have seen that the past ten years has been an almost abnormal you know return for these you know high tech growth companies. Um, and they've seen the successes of the of the Shopify of of, of this world and, and 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 many others where there has been a lot of value creation on the public market and so there's there's just a lot of a lot of appetite um, and and I think so that's on on the one hand so you have a, a very favorable you know kind of public market environment and on the other hand you know you just have a lot of companies coming of age you know, all of these companies that got built from basically 08. Which is when the iPhone got uh, got you know really got got released and and, and got and started scaling. Um, so a lot of these mobile you know whether it's you know actually on the application side on the consumer side all of these mobile related companies the you know Uber, Deliveroo, Airbnb of, of of the world, 
or on the infrastructure side, you know, everything around around the cloud and that needs, you know, and everything that gets needs to be managed on the cloud. Those those two very very large areas, you know, they all got started around around 08. Uh, and and as I was saying, you know, it take you know at, you know a minimum seven years and you know very often you know 10, 15 years to get public. Well, you get to, you know, 20, 2019, 2020, 2021. Um, and there's a few more coming out of that, out of that, you know, that, that cohort. Um, so I think that that's also that, that phenomenon. There's just this, this cohort that was enabled by new technology and new user behavior that is now coming of age. Yeah, I think that's a good perspective, something we've thought about as well. And, and probably if you look at that trend, that's something that's not going to slow down anytime soon since, you know, the ecosystem with with uh, with more entrepreneurs and and with more venture capitalists as well is coming of age as well so there should be you know more mature companies uh hopefully coming also and and being listed in the coming years but uh we thought we'd go over some of your uh investments and and through that also maybe some of your ways of thinking and and mental models and um starting off by by obviously the last 12 15 months have been quite uh, difficult uh, in many ways for for many people, and and many people are, are struggling to reassess, uh, you know, how to think about the world uh, post pandemic or or even now, and and as, and as an investor, you you obviously need to also look at the world as a generalist and and know quite a lot of, of things and and understand quite a wide variety of aspects of it. Um, but how how do you think it's uh, you know how should you assess the the world in the middle of all all this is it is it going to totally change or should you still you know are the fundamentals still the same i mean i think it's the fundamentals are all the same they are but the the, the trends have accelerated um i think people will by and large go back to the office for example I think they, by and large, will go back, you know, eat at restaurants and go to concerts and go to football matches, and you know, I think so. So, a lot of the behaviors we had before, I think people, you know, quite enjoy them, and and that they're all related to you know, like very deep-seated human needs of connected on a human level, of of experiencing things physically with their, you know, with their senses. So, so there's a lot of fundamentals that that are not going to change, but on the other hand, it's it's opened up, uh, it's accelerated in a way that it's 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 forced people to experience things they wouldn't have experienced otherwise, and realize that actually there's a lot of things that they used to do in person that are actually you know done very nicely on 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 the you know on, on the smartphone. I mean, yesterday, just to give you a, a concrete example, I you know I I, I used Livy, or so you know Cree. It's called Livy in the UK. And it reminded me of, you know, basically I, I, go, I went on the app, I booked an appointment, half an hour later I had one and with the GP, you know, they, we had the, the meeting, they recommended me uh, a course of action and it took me, in, you know, it took, it took 10 minutes of my time for the exact same results that I would have had, I had, you know, in, before, which, but that would have meant booking you know calling them trying to find the time probably in two to three days at least going there so taking in half an hour an hour meeting in person half an hour going back half an hour so the whole thing it was you know, not so so i would have had the this the, 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 for the same results because they you know they, they wouldn't have there was nothing to kind of you know examine really so it's a good you know that that's just one example of many things that are just done so much better virtually uh, and that just don't need to be physical because you know it's a, it's a very transactional and that's just one of many but obviously you know healthcare is a massive space so there's some of these massive spaces that are going to move a lot of it is going to move is going to move online is going to move online faster but this was you know Cree was already in existence before covid it was already growing and growing fast so you know it didn't invent Cree. it just kind of you know turbocharged it again um and so so i think that's that's the that's one thing you you talked about mental model and and I and I want to say something about you know about that and and uh, the way the way I you know people have different ways of of working and, and and analyzing things you know some are very intuitive and they go with the flow 
you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm more, um, more analytical. Um, and so just, to, just to, you know, to give you an example of what I did, at, uh, you know, probably in, in April or, or May last year, I spent the day just kind of mind, you know, doing a mind maps of what are the first order and second order consequences of what is happening now. Um, and it was not to kind of top down say, okay, I'm going to invest in all of these businesses. It was more of, okay, just being aware of what are the trends that are going to be accelerated today and in the long run by what's happening. And not, not only the obvious ones of, okay, you know, you're stuck at home, you do telemedicine instead of going to see your doctor in person. But what is the second order and, and potentially third order consequence of that? Um, and so, yeah, I just spent the day kind of mapping all of these just to make sure that I, I, I wasn't missing anything and that it wasn't necessarily to go after these opportunities kind of top down. I, I'm more of a bottom up. I, you know, I like to follow entrepreneurs and, you know, I, I trust them a lot more than I trust myself to come up with brilliant ideas and find opportunities and show me opportunities that are, that are exciting rather than me telling them what they should be working on. But to be more to be to have a prepared mind for what was going to come. Um, so that's just the way I, I know I, I did it. That, that's, so that's just you know, to give you a sense for my way of working. Do you want to share a bit of that mental map or is that your golden goose that you want to keep secret? <laughs> well, I mean, there, there was, there was, you know, the reality is there, there was nothing, there was nothing radically, radically okay. you know, new or unexpected that came out of that. Um, it was more the, you know, making it comprehensive you know, and, and going one or two layers deeper than than just the obvious and forcing myself to have to go through that that thinking and that's something that's actually really hard um when you are in the day-to-day -day, you've got your whatever you know eight nine ten portfolio companies there's always something going on you know some new funding some new strategies some new hiring so you're working really hard with them you've got you know looking at all of these new in potential investments on the other side um but then you still need to find some some headspace to be sometimes a little bit more deliberate and a little bit more structured in your thinking. And that's balancing all of the things. That's a tricky piece. Yeah. Exactly. We mentioned platform economy a few times already through Deliveroo and, and the EU. Uh, but how do, you, how do you view the future of that? You're obviously uh, involved in Deliveroo and Anchor Store. Uh, but looking at the future, what are some of the untapped markets or, or yet to be you know, yet to be tapped into uh, opportunities in, in, in the platform platform economy. Yeah, one area, I mean, I guess when you took said platform, there's an element of kind of marketplace, uh, which is a little bit the way, the way we think about it. Um, you know, there is one big area which we've been investing in uh, quite a bit over the past the past 12 months, which is on, on the B2B side. I think there's still going to be some B2C innovation. Um, you know, food is obviously one, you know, healthcare, like some of these, which are still a lot less penetrated than some other markets, you know, obviously, I guess, you know, secondhand fashion marketplace, you've got some very big players, uh, you know, kind of meal delivery, you've got some big, big players, right? Helling, you've got some big, so this is, so those clearly are not, the new ones are not going to look like the old ones and they're going to go after probably less penetrated markets. But then, you know, there's one massive area which, which, where you still don't have a lot of very big players, which is more on the B2B side. So you mentioned Anchor Store. We also invest in a business called uh, Cargo One, which is kind of air cargo, you know, booking. We just uh, were about to close another investment in, a, you know, kind of a, another B2B marketplace. So this is, the, you know, the, and all of those has been in, in the in the past in the past 12 months, and um, and we believe that's 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 a big area. For a few for a few reasons why you know massive massive spaces you know we're talking hundreds of billions if not trillions in, in some cases for some of these these verticals um and the other thing is is a lot of you know, still very manual or very analog you know base case people use emails and that's kind of the most modern but very often people still use you know use faxes and and, and phone calls you know like if you look at the air cargo market that's still very much how it's done you know you've got these airlines like an airline like tap has has like 30 or 40 employees just managing, taking on bookings, you know, mostly on the phone and through emails. Um, and so, you know, so that, that, that's, that's, that's definitely ripe for disruption. And on the other hand, you have two things happening. You have consumers or actually users who, who, are, who kind of bring the expectations that they have from their personal life. You know, if they can book a, a flight using kayak and, and Skyscanner, why when they work 
in the freight for waters, why can't they book air cargo using the same, you know, as an equivalent to, to kayak? So that, that's what they want. They don't want to take up the phone. They don't want to send the fax. They don't know how to use a fax machine, right? So that just that 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 just doesn't work with that new generation. And plus now suddenly you have again, you know, so you have changing user ex- needs and expectations and technology that's become a lot a lot better to handle these more complex transactions. You know, you need different kind of, of payments. You got a lot of data that needs to be extracted from kind of legacy enterprise software. So you need a you know, very strong API. You need a lot, kind of, a lot of backend integrations. You need a lot more faceting, searching, and like more complex searches, more sophisticated type of searches and, and booking experience versus a consumer, which is a lot more standard and basic in many cases. And those technology just, just weren't there before for that to happen. And we feel like now you've got those two, again, this is a moment where user expectation and technology finally meeting to unlock very large spaces. So that's an area we've been, where we've been spending quite a bit of time. Yeah, we did a, a podcast with a Finnish leading university, actually with a researcher into marketplaces and platform economy. And he, he had the same conclusion as you guys, you guys had. Interesting. So. <laughs> interesting. I need to listen to that. Yeah, no, that was, that was interesting as well. Maybe as a last, uh, case uh we you had this article on your website by mark goldberg and i found it pretty interesting there was this quote uh the battleground for consumer finance has shifted from technology to brand and pop culture has become the ultimate weapon it's kind of a yeah it was a kind of a stopping quote for me how do you view view that since you've been heavily involved with uh with revolut of course yeah i um You know, it is a fascinating phenomenon. Um, you know, uh, I think it took kind of almost everyone by surprise. But when you think about it, it kind of makes sense. You know, people are, uh, you know, they're, they're on they're on Twitter um, and they're on, they're on Instagram, they're on TikTok, and there is you know there is no reason why, kind of you know like w- w- why most sectors and, and most activities would become become kind of gamified and sterified and and kind of. Uh, Uh, and memify to some to some to some extent, and you know, obviously, Robin Hood, um, you know, kind of, uh, you know, saw that and and and, and really sees sees the, the the moment, um, and managed to make you know st- turn stock trading in, in particular into, um, you know, something uh, a lot more accessible to 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 many more people, um, but I would you know it, it's not. That's not, I would say personally, for, you know, I, that's not my strength. You know, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I, when I grew up, I, I didn't watch TV. Um, and so I don't, I don't have a great sense for pop culture. I, I have to admit. Um, and that's, you know, that's not really my framework of, of analysis. I'm more of a, of a kind of analytical structured person. And, and to me, I like to go back always to the fundamentals. Um, and, and a lot, of course, you always have, You know the the, the GameStop and, and and the Dogecoin and some more, uh, you know like you know kind of funny and, and and crazy you know almost kind of you know crazy phenomenon phenomenon. So you don't think it's going to go to the moon? Yeah, no, exactly. Yes, <laughs> all of that you know, and and that's and that's fun. That's entertaining, and, and you know, and it, it's mm. I love it. Yeah. But you know, when I invest, I, I I like to really go back to first principle and and look at is it, you know, is it. 10x cheaper is it 10x faster is it a 10x better experience than the existing and you know like going back almost you know, the jeff bezos approach of what stays the same you know people want you know the cheapest price and the, the more choice and the best convenience you know and really going back to those fundamentals and if you think about revolut if you think about robin hood at the end of the day those were incredible product you know where they had both an insight on a new business model and a new angle to kind of you know make it 10x better so you know robin hood was free you know free trading and fractional trading revolut was free fx so they all had this you know this wedge and the fact that you can't beat free you know that's as good as you know that's as good as it gets and it's so much better than what's existing plus you had an incredible product vision and insight Um, and the fact that on mobile, you know, there, there was a different experience that was required versus what was offered. And you had those two things coming together that made it 10x cheaper and 10x better. 
Um, and, and so it was so compelling that just, you know, as a consumer product, you need to grow at the beginning without marketing. Those are the, 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 all of the most successful consumer companies. There is no, you know, they are supply constraint, they're not demand constraint because they have something so compelling that people can't get enough of and they don't have to sell it. You know, they just have to, all they have to do is focus on building infrastructure and making sure it scales as quickly as possible. Those are the very, very big outliers, all of them in the early days that they had such a compelling value proposition. And then after that, yes, you know, to go to, you know, maybe cross the chasm and be, go into the mainstream, they will all have to become a lot more you know, attuned to pop culture and, 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 and go and become household names and being quoted in rap songs and, and have memes made about them. And, and they, you know, they, then the very, very best, they will, they will get there. But at the end of the day, that's not really, you know, what, you know, I'm not too interested in the one that are just that aspect and they're great memes and they are, they capture the zeitgeist, but there's no first principle thinking because we, you know, we invest for 10 year horizons and, and fads, if it's just a fad, where are they going to be in 10 years? They may be still there, but, they may not. And, uh, and you know, I want to invest in things where I know that the fundamentals are there, that in 10 years time, I can be confident that they're only going to be better companies and stronger and more valuable than, than they were when they were smaller. Yeah, I think that's a good, uh, I mean, no matter what happens, the fundamentals don't change. We're all, we're always going to be social monkeys living on a, a small rock, small finite rock. And that's never going to change. So, or maybe, maybe someday, who's, who knows, maybe in 100 years, we won't be. But uh, yeah, I mean, we have a few more questions. Uh, a few more questions left. Uh, actually, about you, Martin. Uh, you've been at Index for ten years now. Did you say eleven? Actually, in your introduction. So, 11, what yeah. have you learned? 11. What have you learned during these years? <laughs> well, I mean, I didn't know anything when I started. So you know, the, the list, the list is long. Uh, the, the the list is the list is long. Um, but um, well, you know. <laughs> I don't even I don't even know where to start, but but uh, there are, there are a, few, a few things. One is, um, you know, I got very fortunate to to I mean I, I'm incredibly lucky to be to be working you know at Index. Um, this is just a, such a privilege, and uh, you know every day you know kind of you know I repeat it to myself, and I don't even have to repeat it. It's just you know I'm just amazed. Um, you know, I'm, you know, I'm like a kid in a, in a candy store, really. Uh, that, that's how that's how happy I am. Um, and, you know, I've been very fortunate to, it, it's an apprenticeship business, you know, the, the venture capital world. And, and, and you need to, you know, and being able to learn from, from the, the, the best, um, the best investors and, and seeing the best entrepreneurs operate from up close it's an incredible, you know, incredible experience. And so, you know, my first learning is, is try to be, you know, surround yourself and work directly with, with the very best people you can. I mean, it's an obvious thing, but, but optimize for that, you know, optimize for the learning that you get from that, from the direct relationship with, with, um, you know, with, with, with these, with, with, with the very best people. Um, so I think that that's, that, that's something that, that's the most, that's really the most important thing. And that has been the most transformational thing in my, in my life, frankly. Um, because you are just, you know, you, you are the sum of, of the people you, you know, you spend time with and you spend a lot of time, you know, at work. And so, you know, to choose those people very, very carefully. And especially, you know, in, in my case where the, 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 the couple, you know, I spent, as I said, a couple of years in investment banking before, and if I had, I had no intention of staying there and there was, there was always a kind of a short term stop. But if I had stayed there, I think it would have made me a very different person, you know, not only in work, but in, in my life in general, in the people I would have met in my outlook on the world, in you know, my optimism and how I see things. And you know, arguably a much, you know, I, I you know, I prefer the, 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 the person I've become, you know, being, you know, being, being at the index and being in, in this industry. Um, the, the, the other thing which is more related to, to investment itself, I would say is there are very few things that really matter. You know, at the end of the day, there is a lot of noise. There's a lot of movement, you know, always, you know, people are always trying to kind of run around and, 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 and uh, and and turn every stone and 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 get get caught up in in the moment and but at the end of the day you have very few opportunities 
that's really matter. So for me, the first one was joining index. But after that, while at index, there were a few big calls that need to be made, you know, investing in, you know, in, in Deliveroo, in Revolut, in Personio, you know, in, in, in Trainline. And, but, but they all, you, know, you don't have hundreds of them. You know, you have, if you are, you know, most, in most cases, you're going to have one or two. You know, if you're very lucky, you're going to have five, you know, maybe 10 if you're, you know, after a very long, long period of time. But uh, you need to make sure that you make these big calls right, that you are in a position to make these big calls right, and and that and that you see the you know the, the potential. Like wh- when you have this high level of conviction, and you are kind of in, in front of really big opportunities, that you lean in, that you forget everything else, that you know you shut down the rest of your of your life and, 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 and your monkey brain. And you just focus on this one thing and you give everything you have because nothing else matters really, you know, that, at that moment in time. Um, and that's a really, you know, kind of making the difference between what's, what's relevant and what's critical. The thing that the very few things that really, really matter and can change your career, your life, you know, you, like for you know, for the foreseeable for for a very long time, for maybe you know, kind of generations potentially. That that's and that's the thing that it's hard. It's really hard until you've seen it and you've you've lived through these very few companies that 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 go mega. It's really hard to to really to comprehend it because at at the Series A, at, at the seed and Series A, all companies look roughly the same. You know, they all have. I don't know, a million of AR, and you know, they're all kind of roughly the same thing. And and it's hard, it's obviously really hard, but it's, it's so finding and, 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 and identifying the very, very few that instead of, you know, growing 50%, 100% year on year can grow 10x, like just an order of magnitude larger, they are the one that, that, that really, really make a difference. It's not only about investing your money, by the way, it's also about investing your time. If you are an, an employee, you know, joining one of those, you know, absolute rocket ships is, you know, is going to, again, change, change your career, change, change your life, both personally, financially, and on many different levels. Um, and I think focusing on those and really finding those is, you know, is, is that would be at, at, the, at least at the beginning of your career. Uh, once you've done it a few times, you can optimize for other things, but in terms of the learning curve, those are the places to be. Yeah, this is really great. refreshing. Sometimes... Yeah, you sometimes hear these perspectives in hindsight. Someone says like, "When I first, the first time I saw that guy, I knew like that was the." But like, you never knew really. Like, it just ended up happening that way. And and uh, and uh, it's a very refreshing perspective from you. Uh, finally, uh, you, you have uh, some campaigns. Let me read here so that I don't botch up the names. So this campaign called "Not Optional" and Startup Nation Standard. Uh, yeah, feel free to talk about that. And also, I heard you have a podcast coming, Index. Welcome to the club. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. Who doesn't these days? Right? <laughs> exactly. Um, no, so not optional. You know, it's a campaign we've launched maybe three, three a bit, um, you know, years ago. Um, this is. It started as you know. So we've been doing a lot of work around. You know, it started very, very. You know, the first step was every single company was asking us how many options do i need to give to whom so very simple and every board meeting every company is like okay we need to and every partner had a different answer and it was all kind of anecdotal so okay that's not that's not the way to do it we we'll always tell our companies you need, you need to productize and you need to scale things so let's let's do the same for us and let's productize it and let's make something scalable and that can be automated and that can be trustworthy and, and consistent so we um, so we did a lot of work and research around, you know, how much equity is being given to whom at what stage in the U.S. in different European countries, and we created this tool called Option Plan. So we wrote a book and created a tool that allows uh, companies to create their option plan depending on at what stage they are, the valuation, the growth rate, and and, and the sector and and the country basically. And then while doing that. A few things became apparent, one of which being there was quite a big gap between Europe and, and, and the US. So typically Europe, European companies would get half of the number of options at exit you know, versus US companies, and they would give a lot more of these options to senior people versus junior people. 
Um, and the other thing that, ha that, that we realized was that there was a very big discrepancy between European, uh, European companies themselves, depending on where they were. And when we looked at, at, at the reasons why we were less, sometimes less generous in Europe with options and why, especially certain countries had big gaps, is that the legal structure was very, very different. And you had, so we ended up going through that rabbit hole of kind of ranking each European country for how um, uh, kind of favorable to options they were. And options are, by the way, just, just to you know, take a step back, options are the most, the single most critical piece of, of, of tool that you have as an entrepreneur to attract talent into your company. You can't pay the same salary as Google and Facebook. The, your only currency is options. And if, if you are in a country where either options don't exist, which is still the case in some European countries, or so painful and expensive in terms of tax and admin that really a massive headache, they're just not attractive to, to the employees, which is the case in, in Belgium, in Germany, in Spain, then you are at such a big disadvantage. You just can't attract talent into your business and you just can't compete and you can't grow the way you should be able to grow. So this is such an important topic. And so we went to this rapid hole and started ranking countries, realized some countries are brilliant. You know, the, obviously, the, as, as we can imagine, the, you know, Estonia, all of the, the Baltics countries are incredible. Uh, the UK was not too bad. France was pretty good. Uh, and then you had countries that were terrible, you know, Germany, Spain, Belgium, like we, you know, the, Sweden. Uh, so you had, so you had these massive, massive discrepancies. Every country had their own different, different uh, kind of setup. So we started lobbying, which is kind of the not optional is a campaign, really kind of bringing all European entrepreneurs together, uh, especially in markets with, with really poor kind of option plan. And you know, Germany has been a very big movement um, where to try to at least first step is get everyone to, let's say the level of France and, you know, Estonia, um, and then second step will be, let's try to harmonize and create, who knows, maybe some sort of passport where you can use, you know, if you can employ people from anywhere in Europe and you can use one single, it's the same standard everywhere, or at least you can use the standard from your home market to apply to that in employee within that, you know, in that, in that market. So that's really what not optional about. And we've made some big progress in Germany. There's, there's you know, Sweden has made some progress. Ireland has made some progress. Germany, there's a new law coming, but this is this is a long, you know, a, a long-standing fight, and we are and we are, you know, we are pushing uh, super super hard on that. Um, to finish up on, on the on the podcast, you know, just the way, you know, it's it's related to another piece of work we've been doing uh, around helping entrepreneurs, European entrepreneurs, go across the Atlantic and and scale in in the US. Um, and so we've just, uh, we, we, we published a book about that. Uh, we can, you can, you know, folks can find it um, on, on our website. And, and the podcast is kind of a series uh, around that to share some of that knowledge and, and bring more, more color to that, you know, talking to incredible entrepreneurs like, you know, Daniel Eck and, and Peter von der Bos from, from IDM and also the kind of new generation kind of sharing some of their learnings, especially on that, on that, uh, on that very, very topic. Um, and so there's, there's just a lot of, lot of learnings for, for any entrepreneur that, that wants to make it big and especially wants to make it big in, in the US. That's, that's really the, the focus. Sounds really good. Destination USA. Uh, check it out. All listeners will exactly. link to that and also the not optional uh, the program in, in the description of the episode. Uh, it's been a real pleasure talking to you. Thanks so much for, for yeah, joining. Pleasure. Thank you so much. I love it, guys. And great. Thank to you it. to everyone who tuned in. Uh, see you in the next episode again. Take care. Bye-bye. Stay bye. safe, guys. Thank you.